happy feast day, of the incredible subtle Marian doctor, the great blessed Dun Scotus. If you are tuning in on November the 8th, well, it is blessed Dun Scotus day, and I'm thrilled to have you here with us. And indeed, we don't have a very long show today, so uh, depending on where you're at, uh, pop out some delicious uh, ice cold beer, drink one toasted to the great blessed Dun Scotus, or serve yourself some Scottish whiskey, if you will, or some tequila, or whatever it is you enjoy drinking, Diet Coke, Coke, water, anything you enjoy drinking. Celebrate, get to mass today. Think of the incredible, great, subtle Marian doctor. Indeed, the incredible saint who played such a vital role in defending the immaculate creation, the immaculate conception of Holy Mary, his theology being magnificent. Indeed, we're going to look at Blessed Dun Scotus, the language he utilizes, and then we're going to look at a few early fathers that clearly taught the immaculate conception. If you all are like us, one moment, I got it right here then you love and you have a great appreciation for Blessed Dun Scotus. Indeed, if anybody does own our book, our first book we put out on Holy Mary, if you turn it to our dedications page, you have a dedication right there to Blessed Dun Scotus. Uh, the book is dedicated to him. We put so much love into the book. Uh, he was a great inspiration, remains an inspiration for us all the time as Father Kopp is the, the top Mariologist right now. And uh, myself, as we worked on the book on Mary, what a magnificent figure, what a, what a tremendous, what a tremendous church leader, church figure, orator, debater. He, uh, word has it that he massively won uh, several debates in lopsided fashion uh, defending the faith from all sorts of things, uh, Mariology, Christology, Trinitarian theology, uh, the primacy of Christ, the Blessed One, the Blessed Dun Scotus is magnificent in his theology. If you can ever get your hands on a great book of his, of his uh, definitely do so. I will be covering Blessed Dun Scotus in the courses that I give in Mariology, God willing, hopefully sometime in December. But I want to visit a very a beautiful quote of his when he really digs in talking about Holy Mary and then posing the question, you know, was Mary mired in sin, a uh, purged of it later, or was she immaculately conceived? What is the probable opinion of Blessed Dun Scotus? And his is a very clear one. He's very clear that what is more beautiful, what is more magnificent is what is probable as to what happened for Mary. And that was his position. He argued and he defended that and debated it very, very convincingly. He tells us grace is equivalent to original justice so far as divine acceptance goes. So that because of this grace, there is no original sin in the soul that possesses it. Now, notice how we've done a number of shows where we show how Holy Mary was in full possession of that original justice. That is why she's called uh, Mary, full of grace. Hail, gecharito mene. Hail, gecharito mene. That Greek word, that root word that we can find there in the book of Ephesians is indicative of the kind of grace Mary is in possession of. She is in full possession of original justice. That is the one thing we've got to double down on. We have to emphasize it over and over. Remember, when we argue that Mary is indeed full of grace, it is definitely right within the realm of biblical theology, right there in the Greek grammar. Look at what the Greek scholars tell you. Some, of course, uh, interpreted as highly favored, or rather translated as such, but the, the better translation would be um, having been fully graced or full of grace. And, and very clearly, what does A.T. Robertson say, Greek scholar? Perfect passive participle of keratao, and means endowed with grace, enriched with grace, as in Ephesians 1.6, and as we pointed out 
in articles we've written, in videos we've done, in debates I have done, this particular kind of grace is indicative of Holy St. Mary being in possession of original justice. Full of grace is right if it means full of grace, which you have received, which is exactly what the Father is saying, the church says. Wrong if it means full of grace, which you have to bestow. Only our Lord and Savior can do that, which is why we say Mary's full fullness of grace is because of the grace of our Lord and Savior. Nothing she did to merit it. It is permissible, says Blossom de Bruner, of Greek grammar of the New Testament, on Greek grammatical and linguistic grounds, to paraphrase Kecharitomene as completely, perfectly, enduringly endowed with grace. However, Luke 128 uses a special conjugated form of keratao. It uses kecharitomene, while Ephesians 1 uses ekeratosin, which is a different form of the verb keratao. Ekeratosin means he graced or bestowed grace. Ekeratosin signifies a momentary action, an action brought to pass. Whereas kecharitomene, the perfect passive participle, shows a completeness with a permanent result. Kecharitomene denotes continuance of a completed action. Anywhere you look in Greek grammar, you will have the experts telling you the very same thing. There really should not be any kind of objection to this. This kind of teaching is very clearly put forth in the early church fathers as well. And we've done other shows looking at that, <clears throat> which really gets to the heart of what Blessed Duns Scotus is saying. Grace is equivalent to original justice, so as, so far as divine acceptance goes. So that because of this grace, there is no original sin in the soul that possesses it. And Holy Mary was in full possession of this kind of grace that shows us Mary was fully justified. She was in possession of original justice. The scriptures bring it out very clearly. And the fathers emphasize it. This is why the great blessed Don Scotus could say, I say that God could have brought it about that she was never in original sin, or she was in sin for only an instant, or she was in sin for some period of time, and at the last instant of that time was purged of it. But which of these three possibilities is factually the case? God knows. But if the authority of the church or the authority of scripture does not contradict such. It seems probable that what is more excellent should be attributed to Mary. By the way, <clears throat> this was his personal position that he argued for, advocated on, and defended in an incredibly cogent and powerful fashion. He's correct. <clears throat> what is the most probable? Well, it is that which is the most excellent. And he then begins to lay out exactly how this is incredibly excellent, how this is fitting. It is fitting because it is probable it is the most excellent and because it is biblical. What Blessed Duns Scotus is arguing for is the biblical basis for Mary's Immaculate Conception as well as the patristic basis because he does delve into the early fathers as well, as well as the patristic basis. This is the one key thing that we emphasize so strongly when it comes to Holy Mary. And the kind of language being utilized by Blessed Don Scotus, what he was defending, was not a novelty. It was not a novelty. What does St. Romano's tell you? St. Romano's, the melodist, was very clear. The prayers of Joachim and Anna and the weeping of sterility reached the ears of God and were well received. Thus, they gave a life-giving fruit to the world. For while he, Joachim, was praying on the mountain, she, Anna, hid her mortification in the garden. But the barren woman then joyfully brings to light the mother of God, the nourisher of life. Then the tribes of Israel heard that Anna had conceived the Immaculate One. So everyone took part in the rejoicing. Joachim gave a banquet, and great was the merriment in the garden. He invited the priests and Levites to prayer. Then he called Mary into the center of the crowd that she might be magnified. Theotechnos, who tells us she, who was from clean and spotless clay, has come into existence 
in the mode of cherubim. For while still in the loins of her father, Joachim, her mother Anna received a message from a holy angel who said to her, your seed shall be spoken of throughout all the world. This all immaculate creation of Mary, Mary being in full possession of original justice, no room for original sin to dwell, was taught by the early church fathers. St. John of Damascus was very clear. And I have another theme higher and more divine for nature is conquered by grace and while of itself unproductive, it stood up trembling to come forward. So after that, the Theotokos virgin was about to be born from man. Nature didn't dare to anticipate grace's offspring, but remained fruitless until grace itself produced fruit. For it was necessary that the firstborn bore the one born first of all creation in whom all things were established. Oh, blessed coupling of Joachim and Anne, all nature is duty bound to you. For through you, a gift added a more weighty gift to creation than all gifts, i.e. the August mother, the only worthy of him who dwelt there. Oh, all blessed loins of Joachim, from which the all pure sperm, the all pure seed was sown. Oh, epic womb in which the all holy infant was born after she was formed and a little later increased by nutrients from Anne. Her belly conceived in itself an ensouled heaven wider than the wide space of heaven. As my dear friend and the top Mariologist in the world points out, Mary's origins are of all pure seed. Her dignity is affirmed when she is called an in-souled heaven. She is an otherworldly creature. So whenever you look and you read, you read the incredible language being put forth by the subtle Marian doctor, by the subtle doctor, the Marian doctor as he's known, blessed Dun Scotus. This is theology that he would have been familiar with. Indeed, he does bring up St. John Damasy. He was very familiar with the early fathers, familiar with this kind of teaching. And it is because of this that we are able to say, today in your incredibly beautiful feast day, oh wonderful and all holy saint, remember us, pray for us. And before we do wrap up this, this brief little gathering and this brief little celebration, such a wonderful, beautiful day, we'll look at what St. Pascasius has to say before we wrap it up wonderful writings as well. In his Depart to Virginus, I beseech you, let these infamous men cease to speak in such a way that Christ was born as other infants are born. Since the Virgin, Mother of God, did not bear him out of the origin of the first prevarication in order to be reborn, but from the Holy Spirit, without pain and groaning, without annoyance and bitterness, without sorrow and affliction, since all these are most justly the damned and vindictive retributions of flesh in the first origin. What is more, blessed Mary, although she was born and procreated from flesh of sin, as much as you wish her to be flesh of sin, she, from that point and conceptive moment, was not when she is called blessed by the angel, since there was a provenient grace of the Holy Spirit foregone by all other women, Luke says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. If she was not sanctified and cleansed in some other way through the same Holy Spirit, in what way is his flesh not flesh of sin? If too, his flesh comes from the mass of the first prevarication, in what manner was Christ the word flesh without sin? Did he assume flesh from flesh of sin? Of course he didn't, as uh, Pope St. Leo the Great affirms in his Tome of Leo, he didn't, unless first the word overshadowed her because he was made flesh. Whom did the Holy Spirit overcome and the power of the Most High totally possess? Wherefore, truly, the flesh was not at that same instant flesh of sin, and her whom God completely diffused himself and the word came to us by right, not alone. Did he retain neither the law of vitiated nature in birthing, nor the law of first origin which women possessed, if indeed 
His mother had conserved the commandment of all things as if an Eve in paradise. Some time prior, in a manner unlike the Holy Spirit filling her at the Annunciation, she was without original sin, whose glorious birth is especially lauded. Blessed Dun Scotus would have been aware of the wonderful festival celebrations of her conception in early church. Yet in every church, yet indeed, if she were not blessed and glorious, her feast would not be celebrated everywhere by all. St. Pascasius telling us that, that her, her feast day, her birth, her glorious immaculate conception is being celebrated in every church all over the world, in all the Catholic churches of the world. Yet, because it is observed so solemnly, it is established from the authority of the church that in no ways, at the time when she was born, did she come under transgressions, and neither, when she was sanctified in utero, did she contract original sin. That is why the great blessed Don Scotus, we will close by asking for blessed Don Scotus to pray for us, to help bring us closer to St. Mary. Why? So we can grow closer to her son, so we can become strengthened in the graces that can be found in our triune God. Grace is equivalent to original justice, so far as divine acceptance goes, so that because of this grace, there is no original sin in the soul that possesses it. You're right, blessed Duns Godis. And that is why it definitely is probable, and it is definitely true, that what is more excellent should be attributed to Mary, these beautiful things that have done, been done for Holy Mary. Blessed Don Scotus, intercede for us this morning, afternoon, day, evening, wherever anybody is tuning in, even if they're tuning in a day or two after your festival. Pray for us. Bring us closer to Holy Mary. Bring us closer to St. Mary. And because we will grow closer to her son, that is everything she wants. She wants us to grow closer to her son and to become stronger in the faith. Indeed, the very first apparition recorded, ancient one recorded, talks about us growing closer in wisdom of our triune God. There's only one true God, but we venerate the greatest of all his creations in Holy Mary. And today we give you honor, great Mary and Doctor, in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Pray for us, blessed Don Scotus.